nice, one particularly nice thing about compartmentalization visually is that it all it mediates yet undiscovered class of vulnerability. So we want to make all this better and get all these benefits. So our solution is a new hybrid capability system. Um, we've been working at it for a while, as you can see, um, and we have a ways to go. But uh, we started off, I joined the project in here in uh, 2012, and we're still going. We've probably got another two years of funding coming in shortly. Um, so the hybrid capability model, what we want to do is deconflate virtualization, which is to say isolating, isolating things into programs and things are separated from the user space, from protection. The reason for this is that virtualization provides lots of really nice protection properties, but it's extraordinarily coarse grained. Um, you can't, for instance, put every buffer in a page with guard pages on every on either end. Um, that would be ridiculous. Your performance would be um, would be utterly terrible. Um, I mean, people have done it, but you can't in practice. But we, we unlike previous capability systems, we retain a memory management unit. Um, so we have we can run conventional processes. We have all the benefits of virtual address spaces, all the benefits we know and love, um, and we can use conventional Unix operating systems. And we add ISO-level capabilities to implement protection on players. Um, so we have in-address space protection, and each pointer can only point to the op only points to the object in the in the language, not to the entire address space in practice. So I'm going to talk a bit about protection goals, and then I'll walk through how our capabilities uh, look architecturally. So our goal is to target. Um, C language trusted computing bases, also C++, but that's a work in progress. Um, things like operating system kernels, large applications like the Chrome web browser, um, language runtimes, like that million lines of C that's at the bottom of Java. And every bug in that million lines of C is a game over bug for Java's protection model. Um, so you might want to address that. Um, we provide spatial memory safety, which is to say that you've allocated a pointer that point, if you've allocated an object, you have a pointer to that object. Having that pointer only lets you access that object. Um, what an object is in C is a little complicated, and I won't cover it here, but nonetheless, um, fairly strong safety. We also support the ability to implement temporal memory safety, which is to say, to avoid reuse attacks. Um, because we can do things like we can like garbage collect, um, because our pointers are unforgeable, can actually implement garbage collection in C and some other architectural features we need. And we can potentially implement um, copy garbage collection, which is reasonably efficient. Um, additionally, we implement scalable compartmentalization. So we can have compartments within a process um, and at, at function type overhead. The overheads are constant and fixed. They are higher than a function call, but they are very much manageable. Um, and we're doing this in a hybrid model, um, which means that we can run conventional code on our processor. The processor is 64-bit uh, MIPS-based, and we can run unmodified MIPS code, and, yet, and, then continue, and then add capabilities working up from a hybrid model where we have some pointers or capabilities of protecting, say, a TCP up input buffer, um, so that bugs um, produce hardware faults instead of bizarre and unpredictable behavior. And then we go all the way up to the point of a, a pure capability model where all pointers are capability. So, okay. so we've taken a risk approach, which is to say that the instruction set is targeted primarily at the compiler. Um, and, there, and we've avoided things like microcode and table walking. So performance, so the impact of manipulating our instructions, the impact of checking, for instance, bounds on pointers has constant time. This means that unlike approaches where you say have a protection look aside buffer, our uh, carry is suitable for things like real-time application operations. You don't have potentially hundreds of thousands of cycles of mysterious overhead when you check a pointer, uh, which is what happens if you have a look aside buffer. Uh, our goal of our, of our capabilities is to map cleanly to C pointers, or at least as cleanly as possible. Uh, we have tagged capabilities which guarantees unforgeability, so we have tags in memory 
um, for each piece of memory that potentially hold a capability, our current implementation uses an extra section of memory off to the side, um, and the memory controller manages keeping those in sync. Um, but if you were doing this for real, you might, for instance, use an extra ECC pin. Um, so there is pointer metadata. So we have bounds, which control whether you put the objects and permissions. So we have fine grain access control in the application. Um, if you have, for instance, a function that you know will not do anything but read from a buffer, you can give it a read only buffer. Um, um, and manipulate, and in addition to tags, guarded manipulation of, of capabilities ensures that they're non forgeable which is to say that you can only derive a capability from another capability, and you can only monotonically decrease the permissions for the area that it points to. Um, we also, this mentions ceiling. I'm not going to talk about ceiling. Um, but it is an essential part of the uh, environmentalization model. We, I, I will talk primarily about the 256-bit architectural capability model. Our prototype is based on 256-bit capabilities. Needless to say, that has some significant cash footprint. Make your capabilities four times larger. Um, so we are also working on a 128-bit model. So a little bit of covering of the architecture. Um, so start off, let's see here. here. We start off with a conventional register machine. Uh, we, uh, we have a regular integer register set on the side, and we have some physical memory. It's not stuff in it. It might be pointers. It might be data. Um, the capabilities, we have larger capabilities, and they have a tag that's added to them, I've already mentioned. Um, we've also added in a capability register file um, so capabilities can be loaded from memory into the register file and perform manipulations on them within that capability register file and written out. You can also read and write data um, through the capability register file, which is essential for things like implementing MPAP. Or I'm sorry, not MPAP, M M copy, um, because the structure might have capability, might have pointers in it, so you might want to complete it. Okay. So, We've also extended um, the uh, set of standard registers with a program counter capability. So execution is by that capability, um, and the program counter cannot be completely arbitrarily manipulated. There's also a default capability, which is essential to our hybrid architecture. The default data capability um, is used for making memory accesses via the regular load and store instructions. So all accesses to memory or one way or another through a capability, either through explicit capability load and store, loads and stores, or implicitly through this default data capability. In a conventional mix process, that default capability allows access, read-write access to the entire virtual address space. In the uh, case of a hybrid program, it might be reduced in size to only, say, the global variable space. And we've extended a few other versions. So I'll walk through the, the uh, capability um, architectural model here. So here's a conventional pointer today. It's a 64-bit integer. Um, it points somewhere. You can make them up from old cloth. You can excel them. You can do anything you want. Um, and you can come up with all sorts of ridiculous results. And maybe they'll work. Maybe they'll do horrible things. Um, so they're just integer virtual addresses. is there's no integrity protection with these of any sort, and they can just be made up. Um, they can go out of bounds. When you go out of bounds, well, maybe you walk off into, an, into a garden page, maybe you walk off onto something important. Um, it's easy to use them all. So we have added, so to add non-forgeability, we've added the tag, which I've already alluded to. Um, tag memory ensures that, that players cannot be forged and this can be used to track pointer So the first thing we've had, we added is a, a length and a base. So we bound the pointer, uh, which is here, by, by a base, the bottom address that it can address at a length. Um, and the pointer can move freely within that. We had an initial version of capabilities where we only had a base and a length, and it turned out that did not have to see at all. Um, in C, C programs, you do ridiculous things which are not technically allowed. Like you might pass a pointer to here, um, 
to the start of a function which increments immediately before access um, in a loop. Or you might pass the pointer here um, to an image decoding function because that allows the optimizer to use both signed immediates more effectively to access both directions. Um, and so, yeah. Yeah. now, with this change, you can set the bounds, you can reduce the size of your objects allocated you know, in an unmodified C program running in convent, running with peer capabilities. Malloc is responsible for doing that, so it is aware of the fact that it has to put bounds on things. MVAP returns bound in objects, for instance, but um, the user won't have to think about that. Um, the nice thing here is at this point, if you go up here and you try, you can, you can move your pointer up outside the object, but if you try to actually access that, that generates a hardware exception. Now, you've, now your buffer overflow becomes an easy, or at least straightforward to debug. Um, exception, and uh, it's a much better environment. In addition to these basic length, we've added permissions. Um, so we can control whether things can be loaded or stored, whether execution is possible through this capability, um, which um, which both means that we can do, for instance, constant force if we wanted to, um, or have we could have a write-only buffer um, for the output of the decoder. But it also means we can avoid conflating um, data pointers and destruction pointers. This means that even if the compiler screwed up and on a, and this was say a stack, and you had a return address here, even if the compiler made a mistake and got the bounds wrong on the object, if you overload the buffer into the return address pointer and even managed to write a valid data capability, you still wouldn't be able to execute control um, control the code flow. There's a little picture of how um, of, of how pointers are derived from each other in a data program. So you might start off with a data segment. You've got access to your virtual address space. Um, you break that up through malloc into little bits. Um, you've also got your stack, and it's similarly broken up. So here's what we end up in the end for our architectural capabilities. So. Um, I've not talked about the type that's related to compartmentalization. I don't really have time for that today. Um, but uh, we have our, our, our length, our offset, our base, we have our permissions, we have a sealed bit, um, and we have our, uh, our tag. So, so it's, it's important to note that this is the architectural description. This is essentially how it looks in 256 bits. Um, Microarchitecturally, it could be anything, and we try to we, we have made it a principle that you shouldn't care how the bits look. Um, if you, when you start to look at compressed capabilities, our 128 bit capabilities, it is the case that you have to think a little bit about the implications of compression, uh, which reduce the granularity of, uh, of, of the regions you can address. But you don't have to worry about exactly how they're written down on this. Or in memory. Um, so, in our model, We've implemented our architectural basic privilege. So we implement out of bounds, we eliminate out of bounds access, we prevent injection of data um, as, as code or a pointer, code or data pointers. Um, you can't conflate um, pointers to data with pointers to, uh, to code um, unless you do it very deliberately. Um, because of the fact that we store capability, we store return addresses on the stack um, as capabilities. We have code flow, control flow integrity, which means we have effectively eliminated return oriented programming type attacks. Um, and uh, we have scalable compartmentalization that I haven't talked about, um, which mitigates um, a wide array of both existing attacks, yet undiscovered attacks, and even supply chain interactions. And all of this while essentially retaining current programming languages and models. Um, and really, we can support incremental deployments um, nice, very nice ways. So, um, I mentioned before that we have this, this spectrum of, uh, of compatibility. So, 
on, on one side, we can run standard MIPS 64 binaries. Um, in the middle, we can run this hybrid code. Um, and then at the far end, we have peer capability code. Um, I've been focusing my work lately on peer capability code, but we work all across the spectrum. Um, so in hybrid code, um, we, we annotate certain data and code pointers as capabilities, uh, which, which, is, which allows us to protect particularly critical objects. It's also extremely useful. For instance, if you have pure capability code in a compartment, you can use the, the hybrid code to allow you to bridge the gap between conventional MIPS code and hybrid code. In the pure capability code model, all data pointers are our capabilities, and uh, we have strong CFR. Um, the slide says non mix 64 interoperable, and this is largely true, although in fact, um, one of the neat things about the compartmentalization model we use, um, it allows you to create miniature address spaces. So, for instance, we could, although we've not yet implemented, have a compartment which had MIPS 32 code running in it. Um, so, you could run that awful binary decoder um, in an isolated environment, if you so chose. Um, we have strong C, C language compatibility. Uh, we can re recompile most programs without modification, um, and they automatically get spatial memory saved. There's a bunch of ways that particularly bad programming techniques either cause us small change, to make small changes, or will require changes for full protection, for instance, um, programs that implement their own allocator, those allocators will need to be made capability aware, um, or they might just have a big slab of data they're allocating out of. For instance, um, I mentioned Heartbleed at the beginning. Heartbleed was extraordinarily easy to defeat with Cherry if you modified the allocator, um, because the problem was they were using the allocator wrong. Um, by putting bounds on objects, most of the problems could be eliminated. Um, and so for our C language, we have a, a, a client and LLVM prototype. Talk a little more about the hybrid API here. Um, changes required to make the hybrid API work are that memory copy and memory swap functions must be made capability aware, or at least in practice, they must be made capability oblivious so that they, they can copy capabilities and don't even know that they are doing so. Um, the, uh, the main examples of these are memcopy and bcopy. For instance, any struct could contain pointers. We need to be able to copy those pointers reliably. Um, the one that surprised us early on as we started actually trying things is qsort, um, because qsort takes arbitrary objects and swaps them. And it doesn't do this by, swap, by copying them into a temporary um, with memcopy. It has its own clever function, which assumes that if you copy something as uh, long edit longs, that the uh, entire data is copied correctly. In our case, we must copy them as capabilities. It's a simple change. Um, it's about three lines, most of that doesn't get down. Um, but uh, nonetheless, some changes had to be made there. Um, so. We also um, have added capability aware variants of common memory functions. This is convenient if you're converting a bit of code that, for instance, um, uses, say, memcom or sterlen or stercopy, um, and you have a capability annotated pointer. Uh, here's an example of, of, of a function that's been kind of modified, a stercopy function. Um, this is the C implementation of stercopy from FreeBSD, except that we've sprinkled in these capability annotations. Um, and that's really all it takes um, for, for this particular case. Um, and as I alluded to, for cases where you're, where you're working on, say, um, copying words or, or, or whatnot, it can be a little trickier. For instance, there, there are optimized Sterling version variants that uh, read whole words and then use a, a series of uh, binary operations to see if there is a zero in there. Um, and those won't run the capabilities because our strings could be, uh, could be an odd length. So there are a few subtleties there, but for the most part, it really is this simple to make the change. Um, in practice, we go a little farther. Um, in practice, we actually use a set of slightly ugly macros um, to append the suffix optionally 
um, and annotate the capability optionally. So we actually reuse the implement of the C implementations uh, of these functions and just set up some, and, and compile them twice. It's quite easy. Um, practically, I've been working on most recently um, is Cherry ABI as a capability aware system called ABI. This means that um, we can take pure capability code and we can call system calls directly with capabilities as, as the pointers that are passed in. For instance, when we pass open, we pass a capability to a file name. Um, so we go from the original case where we have um, a pure capability ABI, a little bit of shim, a hybrid ABI shim to let us make calls, and then call into the kernel. And we go to a model where we have this pure capability user space, and we have a little shim in the kernel. Uh, the kernel is actually mostly oblivious to capabilities. Um, there's a couple of reasons for this. One is that all the problems you would have in a kernel to make it fully capability aware are the same problems that you have in user space. So we decided to tackle only one of the problems rather than do all the work twice. Um, but also, there were some, some support issues with the compiler. Um, we're only now getting to the point where we can almost run um, a cherry, a, a client compiled its kernel. Um, we got one running last week. Um, it doesn't work with cherry yet. Um, this shim um, allows us to use that unmodified kernel or a very minimally modified kernel and call in with capabilities. So it allows for simple pure capability miners. Um, for instance, we actually have SSH running. We have a buffer overflow free SSH client. Um, we don't have SSHD running because on FreeBSD it links into PAM bits, and PAM bits have threading uh, dependencies. They don't have threading working quite yet. Um, probably another few weeks. Um, so we can we can just run the most code. I have a, a branch of FreeBSD where I actually compile almost the entire user space um, with pure capability mode. Um, there's still a fair bit of debugging to do, um, but uh, we're making quite a lot of progress. So with this work, we can provide ubiquitous memory protection um, across the entire operating system. We have to make a number of little changes. Um, as I already alluded to, there are things like the copy functions. There are also, um, there, there are also some things like um, OpenSSL and LibreSSL uh, have these bits of code to do constant time conditional assignment. Um, and they do these very clever things to ensure that the compiler doesn't recognize what they're doing. Um, because if they're worried the compiler will optimize that to something that isn't constant time. Um, ironically, on all sensible architectures that have conditional move instructions, if the compiler spotted it, spotted what they were doing, it would optimize to a conditional move. Um, so in fact, on real architectures, they'd be better off just open coding the thing. Um, but um, those things, the things they were doing, they were XORing pointers together um, and uh, so, so that they can they could, uh, hit one or the other and XORing them against something that shouldn't be a Boolean. Um, it's very clever. Um, in fact, some of that code, I would really love to see someone find a way to make one of those values and not be a Boolean because then you have an arbitrary code. Um, so a number of small changes required, but actually not very many. Um, and probably the I think, five spots we had to change in OpenSSL was really it for that was specific to getting OpenSSL working and SSH working. So here's a, a slide of all the changes we had to make to the kernel. Um, I think the take home point is actually it's not that enormous. Um, it's a few, it's under 10,000 lines of changes. Um, to make some fairly fundamental changes to the whole system. And in fact, Cherry ABI is the largest, and a lot of that's really boring boilerplate. Um, it is because Cherry ABI has the same problems as, the, say, the FreeBSD 32 layer as for running 32 bit binaries on the 64 bit system. There's a lot of, well, this current, this syscall takes a struct that has some pointers in it, so now we have to go swizzle all the pointers and copy all the elements over. So that's probably half the code there. Um, and the rest of it's little bits of architecture-specific argument handling. Um, so a very brief discussion of current metalization. Um, the 
primary focus that we've had on compartmentalization thus far is library compartmentalization. So this allows us to, for instance, make a version of Lindsay which inside uses pure capability code in a compartment, and outside presents a MIP64 API. Um, so an unmodified MIP64 binary can link against this library and get full protection against any funds in uh, Lindsay. Um, and the neat thing is performance is really quite good. So in this, this uh, bit from one of our papers, our paper at Open last year, um, you see what happens you try to do it with CapSkim, it gets quite a bit slower than everything else. All the other ones are essentially indistinguishable. Um, the, the cherry case, um, either is like at a library level or at an application level where you have a, uh, a big partner memory inside Zlib. Um, there's the baseline Zlib and the Capscom app version, which is what's in FreeBSD today, has the same performance, but that required a change to Zlib. And interesting, and was one of the case studies in the Capscom paper, which both showed how easy it is to do in that the entire change was a few lines. And also, how hard it is to get right, because one of the surprises that came up in the paper was that, act, that it, the, the program got faster when they added a fork. Um, and it turned out the reason it got faster was that they hadn't realized the global variable that, that uh, sets compression level wasn't being passed on into the fork comp, so it's always using the minimal compression method. So there are subtleties there. And, Doing the library eliminates all of that. You know, have all those problems. Um, so, in addition to the uh, example there, um, we've got another example here where we use diff to ping, to ping um, and you see the lines are basically the same. Um, Cherry actually performed better in several cases um, for no obvious reason, probably just weird cache cache behavior. So, very efficient um, to be able to delegate. Um, into this sandbox, and we can do it transparently. So I'm going to talk, shift gears now and talk about Cherry BSD and sort of the, the process of maintaining the system. So a bit of a jump, but uh, um, yeah. I've been running this, I've been sort of the release manager and main revision control person and whatnot for Cherry BSD for four years now. Um, so had some entertainment, um, broken a number of things along the way, I learned a lot of lessons, so I thought I'd pass some of those on. Um, so we started off in Perforce. Um, that was sort of the thing people you did with FreeBSD. Um, we had a Perforce, we have a Perforce license for the project. Uh, it's a good model. It supports merging of changes from the upstream FreeBSD very well. It's easy to maintain stacked branches, so we, for quite a while we had um, Berry BSD, which supports just our mix processor. And then we had Cherry BSD uh, supporting Cherry, which was nice because it let us separate out the changes that we were going to be able to merge upstream as just you know, support for this research MIP CPU. Um, but it wasn't perfect. Um, so the biggest downside is when you can go to the Perforce website, you can go to our Perforce website and look at stuff through the web browser. There's no way to download a Perforce repository from the FreeBSD project without us giving you an account. Um, so it's hard to add users when we got to the point where we were trying to bring in more collaborators. They started to be to add some friction. It's definitely a problem for us. Um, it also isn't really great for having some box at Cambridge continue doing continuous integration on our system. It's, it would need a login. Um, and there's no real offline support. It's a problem for some people. So we migrated to GitHub in 2013. Um, in the process, we lost a bit of uh, history granularity, just to say, I, I took whole sections of the code and just committed them on top of a fresh work of FreeBSD, rather than trying to find which revision of FreeBSD the changes have been merged into and merge them all up, and it would have been possible that it would have been weeks of work. Um, um, some great news is, though, um, easy public access, it's easy to fork. Um, in many ways, the tools are in many ways better. Um, but it really was a trial by fire with using Git at scale. Um, GitHub is a pretty nice system. It scales pretty well. At FreeBSD's repo size, things get a little long. There's a bunch of widgets in the GitHub interface. And if you click on them for any fork of FreeBSD, they say waiting, 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 waiting. You 
open for a day and won't ever come back. Um, they're just not expecting something with this many changes. Um, so that, that was interesting. Um, so what we did, we forked the official previous senior, um, and we, we, uh, we made all of our commits to master. I wouldn't do that today, but that ship has sailed there. Are 12, 000, there are 1,200 commits to the, to the master, most of the merges. Um, today, I would use a cherry branch and use the feature that I didn't realize was there, uh, which is that you can change which branch is the default branch for your four pocket. Um, so that would have been slightly better. And we merged with some previous me periodically. Um, it's a bit more about merging because it's consumed weeks of my life. Um, so the first attempt was you just fetch the whole the whole upstream project and you do a git merge of that on top. It merges all of the changes since the last time you you merged, all in one merge commit. Um, it works, but you have this commit that encompasses every change that you had to make to get all that stuff to apply. Um, and trying to rebase is just has ridiculous results, um, which means that in practice we have to lock the repository um, when I'm doing a merge, because otherwise I can throw out all my work. Um, then we had another problem. So we merged a bug. Um, in this case, we merged a change to an API, which still compiled, but our code didn't work anymore. Um, because we weren't obeying the API, it was you know, this is for BSD current, it was a change to a system that was in flux in the console code. That's all fine. But we wanted to find where the mismatch was, and we wanted to bisect. But the problem is, unlike the case I show here, we know there's merging a upstream has a couple commits, upstream has 3,000 commits. And by the way, none of our changes and these changes were ever mixed together in any way until here. So you can't do a bisect because the problem is the impedance mismatch between the two code bases. Um, so after lots of frustration and, and spending quite a bit of time finding the problem and fixing it, um, I decided I need a better solution. So I've created a tool called Mergeify, um, because I was feeling that way that day, um, which merges one each commit one at a time. Um, so this is the nice thing is you're now blending the stream of changes together, and you're taking each commit to FreeBSD, which you can think of, each one of those is a feature. Um, it's not strictly true, but that's a, I think that's a good model. So you're merging each of those features in one at a time. Um, and other than the fact that some of them don't compile and things like that, it's basically the right model. Um, it means that Bisect is now, now practical, um, but it did require a fair bit of scripting. It's not the easiest thing in the world. Um, so we used that, it worked for a bit, and then our merge of TCP dump went badly wrong. Um, I had made quite a lot of changes to TCP dump. Um, at the time, I think I had 5,000 lines of diffs um, because I had made TCP dump into a hybrid capability program protecting the buffer, and it also added a lot of characterization. Um, Turns out that merging every chain wasn't quite right um, because every chain included the update to the vendor tree. And the vendor tree has a particular, the peculiar property in our SVN web export of sharing the empty repo as the parent but master, which is to say that you merge the commit to TCP dump, you merge it in, and it says, oh, you have a make file. That's great. I'm going to merge source make. Or search make file with TCP dump make file. There's there's definitely commonality. There are several blank lines. <laughs> um, so it turned out that the, the correct solution was only merge the actual commits that are made to the FreeBSD to FreeBSD head, not any history behind the fact it's pulled in all in one log, and then it all applies correctly. Um, so there's there we've also had problems where again you still have the issue where if you are doing a merge and somebody else commits, you have to rebase. Um, that does, Mergeify doesn't fix that, but I did discover recently that, merge, that turning on git re re re, mysterious and underdocumented feature, um, helps quite a bit. What it is, it is replay recorded resolution, I think. Um, which is, so what happens is every time you get a merge conflict, 
it records the pre the pre-state, and when you commit the resolution, it reports it records the, the changes you made. And that means the next time you come around, it pre-applies those changes. So you don't have to hand resolve the conflict. Uh, so it's a nice feature. The result's a little weird, something's not quite right. Um, but it is still a better situation. The merge state doesn't look quite right in there. Um, let's see. I'm going to skip the upstreaming bit here um, in the interest of time um, and give a few tips for developers who are working in an environment like this. Um, so, you know, we all know, especially when you're building mobile a lot, um, you compile and you end up in this, this situation where your code is compiled. And therefore, you can't do any work because you might lose context. It's very important that you don't do that. So, some tips. First off, use a big enough machine. I've been pretty successful in convincing people that this is the right model. George has been buying the project a lot of hardware. Uh, so, with a nice fast machine, with enough, with enough RAM to hold everything in, in memory, um, builds are well below 20 minutes. Um, and this is really important in time saving. It's also you know, if somebody's paying you a decent wage to wait for compiles, they should buy you. They should buy you some hardware so you spend less time waiting on compiles and more time doing interesting work. Um, so one thing I do, I discovered, is that I would go off and I'd be waiting for the compile, and I would go do something else. I would get distracted for an hour, um, and the thing would be done. So I started using a notification service called this one's pushover.net. Um, it has a RESTful interface. Um, you can use curl to send it something and say, so I have a little command wrapper, um, as an example, where I'll, I'll run the command wrapper, and as soon as build world finishes, my phone buzzes. It tells me that, you know, that I have succeeded or failed. Um, it's actually pretty revolutionary. You could write your own, but it'd be really, frankly, dumb because you can buy all, four, all three variants, which is 15 bucks. So, use somebody else's. And you get a little notice like that, or your phone wasn't. Hmm. Um, another, another thing, build in Tmux or screen or script or something. Um, don't send the output to your console, because when you're building you know, with, say, 30 cores, you get an awful lot of build output. And even when you're on a local gigabit network, that will delay you getting back to the console and being able to read the output. It's remarkable, and I think it's actually a fair bit. It's actually modestly faster um, to send to a local Tmux than to send it through SSH. Um, finally, um, use continuous integration. Do some continuous integration of your project. It's extremely important um, to uh, keep yourself honest. Make sure you're not breaking things. And build in modes that you wouldn't test because they're not very, you know, you're not working on that. So we build Cherry BSD. Um, for MIPS, we build it for AMD64, we build it for two variants of Cherry, um, and we do this all the time, every commit. Um, we also automatically do it on hardware, if that's broken um, at the moment, um, due to some problems with the actual hardware. Um, and we automatically build in QEMU um, and run our project test suite. Um, I will, I'm hoping that soon I will be building in QEMU and running the FreeBSD test suite. So quick coverage of papers before I end. Um, so we had a we had a paper in ISCA, the architecture conference on the original capability model. Um, this was the base and length only model. Um, it just talks about how we did the implementation. A paper at ASPLOS uh, 2015 talking about our C language model. We've since refined it a fair bit, but the essentials are there. This is where we realized that we had to have the pointer in addition to the base and the length, um, and that we had to do things like be able to load data into a capability register and store it again. Um, because one of the things in the first ISA is you couldn't implement memcopy without ridiculous gyrations that people were really slow. Um, and we had a paper at Oakland last year, um, IEEE Security and Privacy, on our compartmentalization model. And finally, we had a paper at ACMCCS um, on, a, on a side project funded largely by Google um, called SOAP, which helps do application compartmentalization. Um, and it helps, helps you test hypotheses about the best place to put in, to put in compartmentalization in your program. 
also allows you to do things like run it in continuous integration and make sure that secure, things that you want to keep secure, like keying material, don't begin to leak out of compartments. And there's some neat analysis of Bloomberg Association in that paper, um, putting one case where we found, where we discovered that when privilege separation was added, no one noticed that our host of medication was broken. Um, it just, it was eventually removed. It was never, in fact, fixed. Um, but our, the our host of medication was just lost in the process. And if you had a tool, it would have helped uh, find that. And I suspect what would have happened is it would have been deleted. Because uh, deleting was the right thing to do. Um, so I am essentially out of time, so I'd be happy to take any questions. I will first be around for the rest of the conference and happy to talk about it. Uh, anything related to Cherry, Cherry BSD. So you've been using the MIPS with the new addition of the RISC V. Is that what might be an interesting thing to work with? Um, yeah, so uh, the low risk project, um, which is founding a RISC V at Cambridge, um, is interested in incorporating Cherry. Um, they are adding tanked memory to their first version of the processor. Um, I'm not quite sure what they're going to do with it, but they're going to figure out how to do tank memory. Um, and then, quite possibly, the second version um, will do this five. And we've been, a um, combination of this DARPA funding and other sources have been, been funding Russell's work. Um, so we're, we're ready to go. We're the only operating system whose mainline boots on this five. Um, so FreeBSD is well prepared.